Good evening. Good evening. Well, I'm still Pastor Micah. Uh, and it's good to join with you guys again this evening for our worship. It's always fun to see what churches do for the evening service and where I'll be preaching. Our call to worship this evening comes from Matthew 11, verses 28 and 29. Jesus says to us, come to me all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Our opening song of worship is Our Great Savior, and I'm assuming it's on the thing behind us, or is that? Yeah. Okay, yeah. fantastic. You join me in worship.
this time we will read the Apostles' Creed together. Um, the Apostles' Creed was actually quite often used in the early church as a baptismal creed. So it actually kind of fits tonight because one of the things we'll be exploring is the essentials of the gospel. The Apostles' Creed is sort of the one of, actually I would argue the second shortest summary of uh, a confession that sums up all the essentials of the Christian faith. Uh, and so it's valuable to know, and I encourage you, if you haven't, to memorize it. I'm going to read it because I always forget it when I do it in front of people, but I have memorized it. <laughs> Will you join me? I believe in God the Father Almighty creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of God.
Well, in evening services, I like to be a little less formal. They're usually a little bit more low-key. And I was given sort of free reign with this part of the service, uh, which is the evening congregational prayer. Um, and since I don't know you guys, I thought I would just ask if anyone would like to share praises or prayer requests. Um, All right, we'll pray for Bob Tanner and is he a believer? Yes, he is. We'll pray for him. Even, uh, yeah, it's a difficult time. Henry and Nancy, where were they? <laughs> Florida. Florida, all right. And we'll pray next time they take us with them. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> safe travels. Spring break, she, she asked for prayer for those who went, uh, traveled for spring break and safe travels home. And maybe to add on to that, a uh, good finish to the rest of the school year. I know, at least I remember my sincerity and earnestness <laughs> came back dead. Anyone else? All right, I'll put down uh, council and the search committee. All right, well, let's come before our Father in prayer. Heavenly Father, we come before you this evening thanking you for a day in which we can praise you, worship you, hear from your word, be reminded of your gospel and your truth, and rest, Lord. Father, I pray that this Sunday um, will have restored our souls, and as we Look forward to the week ahead that we might go forth, having been rested, having been fed and encouraged by your word and your truth, to go and proclaim and to live, to be salt and light, your hands and feet, to a world caught up in darkness. Or this evening we lift up Bob Tanner, and his prostate can cancer and the palliative care that he's in. Father, we rejoice that he is a believer and that he belongs body and soul to you. But Lord, we also, we mourn that sickness and disease and death in this life still comes even though it is not the end. Father, at this time, I pray you would just keep your hand upon him that he might not feel the pain. And Lord, that his eyes would be lifted up, that he would see this valley in the shadow of death as not the end. Lord, that in these days you would draw him close to you. And Lord, I just pray that these days might be the days of the greatest hope and joy 
of his life as he looks forward to the fullness of restoration and your presence. Lord, I just pray that your word would be close to him and written on his heart, that your spirit would share encouragement with those who come and visit him, and that he would feel your closeness. <clears throat> Lord, we thank you that Henry and Nancy have made it back home safe. Lord, we thank you for their time to go down south and enjoy the blessing of your creation, the world that you've made, the sunny and warmer weather of Florida. And Lord, as they have returned, I pray that you would create a smooth return, give them the um, opportunities to catch up with friends, to plug back in with their family here in this church. Lord, we think of those who have gone on spring breaks and have traveled. Father, I just pray that you will have blessed and will bless the, the time with families and the memories. And Lord, that you would give those who are returning safe travel home and the children who uh, are returning, Lord, that you would Help them to focus and to finish the school year well. Lord, for our church, we lift up our council, the elders and the deacons. We ask that you would guide them with wisdom and discernment, that you would uh, encourage them and strengthen them as leaders and examples to us, Lord, we lift up the search committee as they begin their process of seeking a pastor. And Lord, I just pray that you would give to this church patience and trust, a reliance and a waiting on your will and your time. Lord, I also lift up our country um, and its leaders. Father, I pray for repentance where there needs to be in our leaders. And I pray for conviction. Also pray that you would set upon their hearts a desire to lead and institute laws and practices that are just, true, and righteous. That they might um, seek the prosper or the prosperity of those whom they oversee. Lord, to you we lift up all these things in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. <clears throat> Our offering this evening is for Tri-Unity Christian School. Is that the one right over there? No? Well, it's... It's in Wyoming. Uh, do the odd... Uh, deacons come forward at this time? Cool. Well, I invite the deacons forward.
Our scripture text this evening is a continuation of Luke. It'll be Luke chapter 24 again, verses 36 through 53. And I don't have the page for that. Actually, 1644. Oh, yeah, wow, you guys have everything already. I'm gonna open up the Bible for myself. Keep it a secret, but my eyesight's not as good as it used to be. Let's pray before we come to God's word. Jesus, as we come to your word, we pray that as you did for the disciples in our text this evening, opening up the scriptures or opening up their minds, that they might understand the scriptures. We pray that you would do the same for us in your grace and in your truth and in your teaching spirit. We pray these things as your children and disciples. In Jesus' name, amen. While they were still talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. They were startled and frightened, thinking they saw a ghost. He said to them, Why are you troubled? And why do doubts rise in your minds? Look at my hands and my feet. It is I myself. Touch me and see. A ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and feet. And while they still did not believe because of joy and amazement, he asked them, do you have anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish and he took it and ate it in their presence. He said to them, this is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. Then he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. He told them, this is what is written. The Christ will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day. And repentance and forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all the nations beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. I am going to send you, I'm going to send you what my father has promised, but stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. This is the word of the Lord to us this evening. Thanks be to God. You have no, many, no idea how many churches I preach at and they don't, they don't know how to respond or they don't know that that's the response. It's always fun. Well, this evening the, the sermon is a little bit more laid back. I have three points and instead of a, um, maybe it's more of a uh, simple teaching or observations that I'd like to draw out of the text. And teach and apply to our lives or in our understanding of the Christian faith. Earlier tonight, we talked about the Apostles' Creed, right? And we said certain things like, I believe in the resurrection. Uh, We live in a day and an age where that idea, that of resurrection, can be more and more spiritualized almost so much to as be a spiritual resurrection that in some churches and faiths um, denies the actual physicality of the resurrection. And so on a text where I preached this morning, and I hope you were guided or encouraged to look to the next life, it's actually pretty cool slash somewhat odd to note that this text is pretty earthy, it's pretty real, and it's pretty grounded. Take a moment and look at just the first 
paragraph of our passage tonight. I'm saying verses 36 through 42, and note just how physical that is, how grounded in reality and flesh and bone. You'll see all these senses brought forth or emphasized, right? The physical standing of Jesus, touch me, see me, um, and then to, to the extent of he even eats, physically eats, as only people, real people do, right? What I like about this text is, well, first off, doesn't that strike you as somewhat odd? The amount of emphasis and focus on that, right? In fact, even Jesus going so far out of his way as to eat, right? To sort of dispel any silly self-doubting which they might have. And for a passage which follows this kind of disappearing act, which we see in the, the passage before, right? Where he vanishes before them, it emphasizes the earthiness. Now, why might that be important? And why might this section right here, verses 33 through 36 through 43 be something I really hope you hold on to as shaping your Christian worldview. Well, it's because throughout history, Christianity has had, I'm going to call them heretical deflectors or sects, sects, uh, S-E-C-T-S, which downplay the actual physicality of the resurrection. Back in the early church, we called them Gnostics. But in the early 1900s, we would have something called a progressive liberalistic view. And we actually see influences of that, that spirituality of the resurrection showing up in a lot of churches and preaching today. It's subtle, and it's not totally wrong, but it was even somewhat present this morning. Did you notice it? Yes, it's true that the Holy Spirit lives within our heart, but this morning we, we sung a song. We, I know my Savior lives. You ask me how I know he lives. He lives within my heart. Yes, his spirit is in within our heart, right? As believers. But that song actually has somewhat of a background coming out of this idea and motion, partially true, that can be taken too far, right? Think of that in response to this passage right here, 36 through 43. Yes, Jesus' spirit lives within your heart, just Jesus is in your heart, but he's also fully physical and fully resurrected. One last thing to really emphasize just how this view of downplaying the physical resurrection and maybe upplaying to an unhealthy point the spiritual resurrection. I saw this um, video earlier this week um, on YouTube. You guys know who Christopher Dawkins is? He's a very, um, very loud, very well-published atheist in Britain. <clears throat> and he had, well, he has devoted his career to dismantling Christianity and the absurdity of the Christian faith. But as he was interviewing with this commentator, he was frustrated as his country, Britain, was promoting Ramadan. And I want to grab some of his words because they are sort of remarkable. Here's what he said. I'm not a believer 
but I'd call myself a cultural Christian. And so I was horrified to hear that Ramadan was being promoted. I do believe we are a Christian nation, there's dis, there's a, but there's a distinction between being a believing Christian and being a cultural Christian. And so I love the hymns and the Christmas carols, and I so feel at home in the Christian ethos, but I'm not a believer. This passage, which starts out with six verses emphasizing physical belief, stands in direct contrast to type, that type of thought, which does creep in. This kind of Christian idealism that is abstract, but not grounded here. So what I hope you first see, and this is my first point, I call this section real believers, is that yes, Christians are focused or looking to the next life, but that has real grounds and foundations in this real life, real world. It's not fanciful idealism. It's just a powerful passage to see and to note. Maybe one last thing, and I will say this. Uh, this comes as my own testimony, part of why I chose to go to church in Grand Rapids or to Calvin Theological Seminary. My sister went to a church in which they preached Christ often. Every sermon was about Christ. And I would go with that, her to that church. But I noticed something. Have you guys ever seen The Princess Bride? There's a guy who's like, uh, he says, inconceivable all the time. And at one point, a character says, you keep saying that word. I don't think you know what it means. Christ is a title. And actually, in a day and an age, today and in this age, the term Christ is thrown about without any historical attachment. So you'll see this has shaped my preaching because I've seen this, a denial of these first seven verses. If I use Christ, and I try to use Christ in, the, in my preaching, I naturally love to use the term Christ. Paul does it all the time in his letters. But in my preaching, you will often hear me say, Jesus Christ, because Jesus was a historical, is a historical, real man, and Christ is his title. It's not abstract. So real believers, that's the first section that I'd like to emphasize, that we have a faith grounded in reality and not built in castles, built up castles in the air. The next point I'd like to bring out from our text this evening actually has to do with verse 45. Verses actually 44 and 45. It says, Then he said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, and that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. We live in a day and an age that is highly emotional. That's not totally a bad thing. What I mean by that is um, how we feel often grounds our view of everything, right? Very um, feelings-oriented understanding of the world. And we see this in phrases within the church, which are not wrong on their own, not entire, not wrong, but they're not everything. And so one of the things that I have written down here is a personal relationship with Jesus. Yes, every Christian should have a personal relationship with Jesus. And I hope each of you would say boldly, 
and easily. I have a personal relationship with Jesus. And the next question I would ask you is how often do you read his word? Does it parallel? Is there a correlation? Because this passage right here, these verses right here, tell us that there ought to be for two reasons. And I hope you see this. These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and Psalms must be fulfilled. So all of the scriptures are about him. So to know him, where might you go? To truly know him, you should be driven to the word. But then that goes on. Do you see how he reveals himself to them? This is Jesus's initiative. This is Jesus's prerogative. He opens their minds to understand the scriptures. We live in a day and an age where biblical illiteracy is a term that is legitimately been coined. And if you don't know what that means, it means that people don't know their Bibles. And they don't know what's in their Bibles. This whole sermon series. Actually, a friend of mine did a sermon series on phrases that sound biblical but aren't actually in it. This passage reminds us and should ground us with a personal relationship directly correlated with Scripture. Yes, prayer is there too, and spiritual disciplines, fasting, all these things, worship, Sunday attendance. But to know Him, how He reveals Himself, He intentionally willfully chooses, and it's by his initiative he reveals himself through the scriptures. Finally, and this is going to be homework out of this passage for you. It's something I've done at churches that I like to do. It's just a test. I Test is probably too strong of a word. It's something to spur your mind to think. So I've talked several times now about partials, but not the whole, right? This morning I asked you about Romans 3.23, the verse section that we all know by heart, but then the full meaning and the purpose of it, right, which continues on, are freely justified. Here's my homework question, my third observation from this text. The question and the homework is for you to go home and write in three to four sentences, what is the whole gospel? What are the five elements? Just like the Apostles' Creed, those elements that are core to the Christian faith, Yes, there are churches that have all sorts of differences, but to be fundamentally within the Christian faith, the Apostles' Creed is about as simple as it gets. I mentioned earlier the other creed or confession that I believe which is simpler. Um, this is maybe the least orthodox part of me. It's both tongue and cheek. I think the simplest confession we see in Scripture is doubting Thomas's, my Lord and my God. That's all one needs to say to be Christian. But with a Bible that's this many pages, with all the information, it's a pretty vague confession, don't you think? So what is the gospel? And I will ask you to go home and do that, but I will give you some guidance and hints. Usually when I teach this, I make them come up with it first. For that, I want you to look for, look at verses 46 through 48, because I think it does a well, a good job of capturing the, the few elements that are absolutely necessary. 
Thus it is written that Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead and that repentance for the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all the nations beginning in Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. One last point on the realism of, uh, of this text. The you are witnesses of these things is said in the Greek. Um, it's said in the indicative mood, which is the mood of reality. I absolutely love Greek for that because it, oh, it's a man's language. If you say, I'm fine in the indicative mood in Greek, it literally means I'm fine. It's teasing there. So what do we see in this passage, in these verses here? Well, first you see that Christ must come, suffer, and die. That there is a wage to be paid. Then you see repentance is necessary. What is repentance? A turning, a change, authentic. You see forgiveness is present. You see sins stated in this verse, which is something churches avoid and gospels today don't always state. It's a truth that in American churches, we have gospels for good people. But here, this is towards sinners. Finally, we have purpose in the proclamation and the witness. And that is brought to completion and will be continued in this, at the end of this gospel, but it says, Behold, I am sending the promise of my Father upon you, but stay in the city until you are clothed from power, with power from on high. Power from on high to do what? For what purpose? the proclamation in his name of the things we've seen in the gospel, that sin, repentance, forgiveness, and death on the cross. So those are the things that I hoped to bring to your attention, things that I hope we will dwell on and think on, and maybe in the weeks ahead see opportunities to uh, correct or share or just be more grounded in the fullness of our faith. Will you join me in prayer? Heavenly Father, we just thank you that you have given us sound doctrine, full reason and reasoning to believe. Lord, that you have you're given us your word and your truth, and then you haven't just left us with dull ears and slow hearts, but you have opened up your word that we might live not on bread alone, but from it from what you say and speak to us and over us. Lord, as we go forward into this week, Lord, I pray that our new lives in you would be real things, real witness. Lord, that we would not fear being radical or called crazy for actually believing, for actually knowing that you are risen, that you will come again, that the resurrection is not just spiritual, but it is physical. And Lord, I pray that the gospel in its fullness with the 
uncomfortable truth of our fallenness and our sin would not be something we shy away from, but something we embrace, for it makes the grace and the truth and the beauty of forgiveness and peace fully accomplished and offered by your Son so good. Lord, that we might share and proclaim that glorious gospel. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Our song of response is Love Divine, All Loves Excelling. Will you join me in response? and receive these words which are God's spoken to you. These come from Romans chapter 15. Now let the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Go in peace.